All right, folks, welcome to part three of the demonstration for the leaded steel bushings project for machining 220 uh, in the machine technology department here at Laney College. Today we're going to be performing the finishing operations on the bushings. So that's from step 10, basically. Again, I've got my print with me, and this is actually going to be even more important at this stage of the game than it was when we were roughing, okay? That's because we're going to be trying to hit all of these tolerances on here, including the tolerance for diameter B, which is specified in this table up here. Remember that there are two parts that we're making, and the only difference between them is that inside diameter. So one is 875 plus or minus 2, the other one is 885 plus or minus 2. Just a little bit of a strategy thing here, it makes sense to try to make the 875 diameter first, because if you accidentally overcut that, you can still make an 885 out of it, right? But if you try to make the 885 and you finish that one, and then you try to go in to make the 875, well, if you overshoot that, well, you already have an 885, so basically you just made some scrap. We're also going to be trying to hold this geometric dimensioning and tolerancing on the part, right? So run out within a thousandth of an inch to datum A, datum A being the center axis of the outside uh, diameter on the part. I mean, this neck down diameter, not the big one on the end of the shoulder here, okay? Uh, and then we're also going to be trying to keep a perpendicularity call out within one thousandths to datum A of the flat shoulder. Okay, so that's an easy thing to do as long as we do everything in one setup. But if we go taking the part out of the chuck, after we've already finished some of the diameters but not all of them, then it's going to be really difficult to hit these uh, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing controls. Like if we finished up that inside diameter, we bored out the inside diameter and then we took it out and we tried to put it back in, then we'd actually have to indicate the inside diameter being the only finished surface on the entire part, and we'd have to do it within one thousandths of an inch so that when we machined the outside surface, which became our datum feature A, then the inside diameter would be uh, within the runout control to that outside diameter. But that's a difficult thing to do, as I showed you in the first part of this demonstration, because you have to get the diameter that you're referencing on the part perfectly collinear with the spindle axis. So not just have the two axes parallel to one another, but you also have to account for any angular misalignment as well. So you have to indicate in two spots or one spot plus a face. But if you don't have any other faces that you can reference, then that means you have to indicate two spots on an inside diameter so you have to get a small, like, test indicator to fit inside of that hole. This is really not a trivial task. Now, I know that I keep harping on about this, but you would not believe how many people, despite all of my warnings, end up taking the part out of the setup after they've already got finished surfaces. It's mind-boggling how often people do it. Please, save yourself the trouble and just finish everything in one setup. In most cases, it's faster just to rough out a new piece than it is to indicate it in this way. Anyway, as I mentioned in the last video, the overall strategy here is going to be rough the outside, rough the inside, then finish the inside and finish the outside. So it's a sort of first in, last out kind of procedure. So we're going to be starting off with the bore. Then we're going to machine this outside diameter that becomes datum feature A, and then we're going to machine this outside diameter on the shoulder. There are a number of things that we have to watch out for here, more than just the geometric dimensioning and tolerancing controls. We've got some lengths that we have to maintain. We've got some very tight size dimensions. Two thousandths of an inch right here is the tightest that we've got. Uh, we've also got plus or minus two thousandths, so four thousandths total, and over here we've got a total of three thousandths, okay? So that's all pretty tight. And then we also have to worry about these surface finishes on two of the diameters. So the outside diameter here that becomes datum feature A, and then the um, inside diameter, uh, diameter B, which is given in the table. So we're going to have to take extra special care so that we dial in the feeds and speeds and the cutting conditions so that we can get that nice surface finish in there. 
Okay, I've already gone in and set up all of the tool heights that I need for all the tools that we're gonna use. The parting tool, this is gonna be the outside diameter finishing tool. The only one that I haven't done yet is the boring bar. The boring bar is a little bit tricky because there's actually a few different points of alignment on here. Not only do we need to adjust the boring bar up and down to get the height of the cutting edge equal to the center axis of the lathe spindle, okay? But we also need to adjust a stick out, okay? Because we have to bury this boring bar into our hole. So we need to make sure that it's sticking out far enough so that we're not going to slam into the tool holder before we get to the bottom of our cut, right? And then the third thing that we need to adjust is the 360 degree orientation of the boring bar, right? Basically, which way is the cutting edge angled? Because there are a number of different positions that we can set it in. By the way, it's really imperative that you select a tool holder which has a V groove in it. Otherwise, you're going to be clamping a round or cylindrical object up against a flat surface, which is not going to hold it very rigidly, okay? So that V groove is really essential here. That way we'll get good three point contact on the boring bar. So the set screw will be one point and then the two sides of the V will be the other two points. So the depth of our hole is gonna be about two inches. So we need to give ourselves a little bit of a safety margin there. So maybe we stick this out like two and a quarter inches or something like that. The next thing is that there's a little scribe line in the top of the boring bar and that's there specifically so that we can line it up with the set screws, okay? So basically that uh, scribe line is telling you where the top dead center position of the boring bar should be when the insert is in the correct orientation. So we align the scribe line with the set screws and that gets us to the correct orientation. And that looks pretty good to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and lock that down. Okay, this is the insert that we're going to use. This is the little CCGX uh, uncoated tungsten carbide insert with a very, very, very high positive rake angle, okay? This is actually designed for aluminum, but taking fine finish cuts in leaded steel, uh, it works okay. And uh, you know, it can be very difficult to get a good surface finish in steel because it likes to tear. So we have had reasonably good luck with this tool, although it should be said that it's very, very fragile and prone to breaking. Okay, so you have to take extremely good care of these inserts, right? Uh, we only have two sides that we can use. We actually can't use the bottom because it's a positive geometry. Okay, so uh, it has a built-in relief angle on it, all right? So we can only use the top, so we only get two cutting edges, all right? And these inserts in general are pretty expensive. It's like a triple whammy. It's fragile, it's expensive, and we don't get as many uses out of it as we do with other inserts, okay? So please be careful with these. Okay, I'm gonna back off the set screw for the insert. Okay, the seat is clean. The insert is clean. This is a brand new insert, by the way. And it's the same insert that we're going to be using to finish the outside diameters. Okay, so uh, I'm only gonna give you one of these inserts, right? This is something that you have to come to me to get. Um, and uh, I really want to monitor these so that I know that we're not just going through them because we're being careless, okay? So at the end of the day, it comes back to me. And you're gonna use the same one for both the boring and the uh, outside diameter finishing. So you can just move the insert from the boring bar straight to that other tool holder. When we set the tool heights for one of the regular square tool holders, because it's got flat sides on it, all we have to do is loosen the set screws on the tool holder flip it around, adjust the height, and then we can flip it back around and it holds its same orientation. But because this is round and it's sitting in a V groove, actually, if we were to loosen this, flip it around in the tool holder, set the height and then come back over here, when we readjust it, it's going to change its indexed position ever so slightly and it's not gonna be on center anymore, okay? So we really need to actually swivel the entire tool post in order to get this cutting edge to line up with the live center so that we can adjust its height. So 
So something like that. And then we can lift it up a little ways. Now with the boring bar, you're going to want it to be exactly on center or slightly above center if it needs to be off of center at all. Here we don't want it to be below center at all, okay, because that's going to cause rubbing. It's the opposite, actually, of adjusting the height of a tool for the outside diameter, where the worst case scenario is to be slightly above, because then you're going to rub underneath the tool. Now we're going to rub underneath the tool if we're too low, okay? A little bit more. Okay, that's looking pretty good to me. So to reorient the tool post, you can pick any of your favorite methods. I'm going to do this by eye, lining it up with the side of the cross slide, and then lock it down. And that's all there is to it. Now we can go in and start machining that inside diameter. So this is going to be step 10 slash 11, boring out the inside diameter either to 875 or 885, depending on which one you're doing. But this is the first one that we're doing, so we're going to shoot for the 875, just so that in case we overshoot, we can always make the 885 out of it. So we're going to have to set a depth as well as a diameter. And the diameter we're going to set in essentially the same way that we've been setting outside diameters, except that we're going to be doing it from the inside out. Okay. Uh, but the depth we're going to have to set in a slightly different way because the boring bar is going to be all the way inside of the part, hidden from sight. So we need to create some kind of a way to tell where the boring bar is without actually being able to see it. Now we could set up a dial indicator on the carriage here and go based off of that, uh, but the problem that we've run into is that people are so fixated watching the dial indicator that they're not looking at what's going on up here at the cutting tool, and then they can run into some issues. So what we've started to do is just use a piece of tape and a Sharpie mark as a visual indicator of where the bottom of the hole is, and it works pretty well. Keeps your focus on the cutting tool. Okay, so I'm going to apply some tape to the outside of the boring bar, like so. There we go. Okay, then I'm going to position it up next to the inside diameter, not actually touching the inside diameter, but close to it. Okay, and then I'm going to run the boring bar into the part very, very carefully. Okay, nice and slow. Remember, these cutting edges are incredibly fragile, and if you jam them into the back of the part too hard, they're going to snap right off. So I'm feeling for any kind of resistance. Okay, right there. Come in with the Sharpie and just make a little mark right there. So now I know that where the very front of the Sharpie mark touches the end of the part, or lines up with the end of the part, that's where the bottom of my hole is. And I'm actually going to back off a little bit, okay, and then make another little mark, just so that I have sort of a, you know, a, a warning mark and then a final position mark. All right, let's turn it on. Okay, I'm going to go back into the bore, and I'm going to pull back on the cross slide now. So we're no longer going into our number, we're coming out to our number. Slowly back it up, just until it touches the inside diameter. You can hear a little sound, and it's going to shave off a tiny chip. Right there. Okay, back it out zero my cross slide dial. Okay, now I'm going to take a cut of, let's say, 20 thousandths of an inch, just to clean up the drilled surface in there. Okay, so from my zero, I'm going to go counterclockwise 20 thousandths, okay? Remember that we're coming out to our number now, not going into our number. So we're going to have to go in the minus direction on the dial, okay? So zero minus 20 thousandths gets me to 0.18, the 180 thousandths mark. I'm going to set a relatively slow feed rate of 3 thousandths of an inch per revolution. 
So that's L, C, T, 4, and W. I find that boring really likes to have a little bit of coolant. You don't normally need to use coolant with carbide. Um, and in some cases, like on a milling machine, you should not use coolant with carbide because it can cause thermal shock and uh, fracture the inserts, okay? But with a lathe tool where the tool is constantly engaged in the material, then a little bit of coolant is fine. It's just not usually necessary, but here I think it really helps, okay? I'm gonna engage the cut. Coming off really nice. Okay, there's my first mark right there, and stop. Gonna feed in the rest of the way by hand to the start of the Sharpie mark. Then I'm gonna push the tool out a little bit and then remove it. So yeah, I, I pushed the tool out this way and then removed it so that I wasn't dragging the insert along that edge. And look what happened here, okay? those little chips basically had nowhere to go because the boring bar was blocking the start of the hole. So the chips just accumulated on the front of the boring bar. And so if we take really big cuts this way, then the chips are gonna be even bigger and they're gonna pack up at the bottom of the hole and potentially actually break the uh, boring bar or the tool or even weld onto the inside of the part or knock the part out of alignment. Basically, if we're packing up the bottom of the hole with chips, then it's like machining into a wall, right? No good will result from that. So we try to take smaller cuts when we're boring and we make sure to clear the chips. And yeah, you can see that there's, there's some chips in there, okay? So we'll blow that out. just so that we can clean it up. Now, the surface finish in there is absolutely incredible, okay? And I highly recommend that when you're using this insert and these tools for the first time, trying to achieve a 32 finish, that you really practice with a few cuts. Uh, set everything up like you would for your final cut, your finish cut, and then see what kind of surface finish you can get at those settings. And this is pretty amazing. I'm very happy with that. So I don't think I'm gonna change anything about it. But now that we've got a good cleaned up surface, we do need to start measuring it, all right? So we're going to be using a telescoping gauge to measure this, all right? Remember that a telescoping gauge, it has these two spring-loaded contact points, and then you can lock them with this little knurled screw on the end there. And then to release it, you just pop it out like that. You, you loosen the screw and the two contact points pop out, all right? I see some people misuse this. Like they try to get it aligned perfectly so that it's reading across the diameter and then they try to lock it and remove it delicately without changing their reading. And that's just not the way to use this. And there's no way you're gonna get consistent repeatable results that way. Now the proper way to use this is to put it up into the hole like so at a slight angle lock it down, and then you rock it out of the hole like this. And then that way, it'll naturally conform to the diameter of the hole that it's in. The contact points are rounded, by the way, so they will only touch at a single point on the apex of the diameter. And because we locked it, when it conforms to the diameter and we pass that sort of high spot in the center there, then it won't spring back out, okay? And now we just turned an innie into an Audi, and we can measure over this with just a regular zero to one micrometer. Okay, so something like this. And we try to get the telescope engaged so that it's aligned to the micrometer really nicely. Okay, and we're not gonna use the ratchet stop. We wanna be really careful with how much force we put on the telescope engage because it can 
you can push the contact points in a little bit. So I just kind of go in until I can feel it touch, and then I rock the telescoping gauge around to make sure that I've got the same feel on the micrometer that I had inside of the hole. And that feels really good. Okay, so that is telling me 825 plus basically 7 is 832. So we're shooting for 875 and we're at 832 right now. So we've got 43 thousandths left to go. I took a cut of 20 thousandths just now at a 3 thousandths per revolution feed rate and it came out perfectly. So I'm going to try to recreate that. All right. So I'm going to take maybe two more cuts and I'm going to consider this to be within the finishing range for this diameter. So I'm going to take another cut of 20 thousandths and see if the diameter changes predictably. If I tell it to take 20 and then I remeasure it and it takes exactly 20, then I know that I'm good to go. And I can trust the adjustments on the uh, machine. Okay? And if not, I'll have to think about what to do. Okay. So my last cut was at 180 thousandths, and I'm going to go another 20, so that gets me to 160 thousandths. Okay, a little bit of coolant, and engage the cut. So you can hear that little bit of chattering in there. We'll have to see what that did. Okay, right there. And I'm going to feed it by hand the rest of the way. Okay. This is my second to last cut, so I'm not going to back off of the uh, cross slide. Okay, but I am going to turn it off. Just so that I don't put like a spiral groove into the inside diameter when I pull it out. Okay, now I'll pull the tool out. You can see it got packed up with chips pretty good. The inside surface has a little bit of chatter. So this is kind of what I was worried about. It's the whole reason that I took a test cut first to make sure that those cutting conditions would result in a good surface. And of course now, after I've already started taking my finish cuts and there's not as much that I can do to fix it, it starts to chatter. Well, you know, I think that Murphy of Murphy's Law fame was probably a machinist because this seems to happen a lot, at least to me. What can you do to correct for chatter? Okay? One is that you can lubricate the cut, which we're already doing. The other is that you can reduce your stick out. That's actually a really big one. So you should have the minimal amount of stick out from the tool holder so that the point of cut where all of the loading is occurring is as close to the point of support as possible. If you shorten this distance as much as you possibly can, while still maintaining a little bit of a safety margin, right? But if you shorten this distance as much as you can, it'll make a big difference when it comes to your chatter issues. But now I'm already taking my final cuts, right? So I can't really change that stick out without having to go and mess around with retouching the tool. So there are a couple of other things that we can do. In general, the rules for getting rid of chatter are like the opposite of the rules for getting a better surface finish. So for getting a good surface finish, you want to spin it at a higher speed, slow down the feed rate, and take a smaller depth of cut. To get rid of chatter, you want to spin it at a slower speed, increase the feed rate, and actually the depth of cut, sometimes it's better to increase it because it will load up the tool and give it some support. And sometimes it's better to take less of a cut because that'll, you know, just put less loads on the tool. But that, that's the general idea there. So I'm going to go ahead and slow this down to the next fastest speed and we'll have to see what it does. Okay, I'm also going to go ahead and measure it. Right there, that's telling me 851 thousandths. So we're at 851 right now, and before we took this cut, we were at 832. So we told it to take 20 thousandths, and it took 19. 
That's pretty close, but it's not perfect, and it's probably because of this chatter issue. The tool was deflecting during the cut. So another thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to half my cut, all right? Instead of taking 20, I'm going to take 10, because I don't have much more room to play with in here. We'll see what that does. Okay, adjust it 10 thousandths now. Give it a little coolant and engage. So that's already sounding a lot better. Let's see if it also gives us a good surface finish. Okay, right about there. Feed the rest of the way by hand. Okay, stop it. Okay, pull it out. Get those chips off of there. Blow the chips out. That's looking much, much better. I'm quite happy with that. I'm going to go ahead and take another measurement. Right there. Perfect. Okay, so that's telling me 850 plus almost 11. So 860 and 7 tenths of a thousandth of an inch. So we're at 860 and 7 tenths, and the last cut was at 851. So we asked it to take 10 thousandths, and it actually took 9 thousandths and 7 tenths. So that's pretty close. Okay, so I think I can trust that. To get us the rest of the way, we're going to get to 875 as a final dimension, minus 860 and 7 tenths, which is where we are now, gets us 14 thousandths and 3 tenths of a thousandths, which I'm going to take all in one go. A little bit of coolant. Go in 14 thousandths and a little change and take the cut. This one's for all the money, folks. Right there. Just a little bit more feed in. Okay, now I'm going to feed the tool out a little bit to get it off of that surface so that I don't uh, damage the surface when I retract the tool. Come out with it. Turn it off. Okay, clean up those chips. It sounded good. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Even better than the last one. Great. Okay, I'm going to take a measurement. Like so. Very good. Okay, that's perfect right there. Perfect amount of drag. So what did we get? 875 on the money. Beautiful. Okay, so that feature is done, and it's time to move on to the other surfaces on here, okay? Now, we're going to go in and quantify that surface finish a little bit better than just ooing and aahing over how good it feels on my finger, okay? But I'll show you how to do that on the outside diameter because it's a little bit easier to see that finish, okay? And then when we finish all of this up and we do the final inspection, uh, then we're going to use something called a profilometer, but that's going to be another video. Remember that if you were going to make the second one of these bushings, all you'd have to do is machine this inside diameter out another ten thousandths of an inch to get to 885. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and clean this tool up a little bit. I'm going to remove the insert. put that set screw back in there just so that I don't lose it. Remove this tool. Now put the outside finishing tool in. Make sure that that's nice and clean. Remove the set screw. Put the insert into this tool holder and tighten that set screw.
Okay, we're ready to go. So there's nothing really special about turning this outside diameter, except that I'm going to pay extra special close attention to getting a good surface finish, and that I'm just going to stop it by eye when it gets close to that shoulder. Okay? I'm going to move that shoulder around as I need to, but at this stage of the game, I'm just going to worry about getting this diameter in. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. I'm going to feed into the diameter. Nice and gentle like, just until I touch off like that. Set the zero on my cross slide. Then I'm going to take a cut of 20 thousandths. I'll give it a little bit of coolant. It makes a difference sometimes. One thing that it really helps to do is it keeps the chips from re-adhering onto the surface, which can really help the surface finish. So this is that same three thousandths of an inch. And I'll stop it right there. Feed a little bit further, okay? And now I'm gonna pull the tool out one revolution and back it off. What does that look like? That looks pretty good. Yeah, that looks great. That's a nice cut. What, what's weird about this is that you're not gonna run into chatter issues when you're cutting the outside diameter because it's just a much more rigid cutting operation, right? But for some reason, it's harder to get a good surface finish on the outside diameter than it is on the inside diameter. Inside diameter almost always comes in, although it's hard to control the dimension, right, to get the right size on the inside diameter than, than it is to uh, get the right size on the outside diameter. But the surface finish, for whatever reason, on the OD is a little bit more difficult to achieve. Let's take a measurement here. So it's the regular old one to two micrometer. Okay, and it's telling me one inch, 175 plus seven and a half. So one inch, 182 and a half. We're trying to achieve one inch, 160 to one inch, 162 for that outside diameter. This is a limit dimension, right, where it gives you a lower limit and an upper limit instead of like a target size and a plus or minus value, okay? So one inch 162 minus one inch 160 is two thousandths of an inch, which is a pretty tight tolerance. And we also need to achieve a 32 finish on that. So the last cut was at one inch 182 and a half, okay? And we want to get it down to one inch 162 as the top of the range. So that's 20 thousandths and 5 tenths. I'm going to take that all in one go, okay, because my 20 thousandths cuts are going pretty well. Okay, back into my position. And another 20 thousandths and some change. I'm actually going to go, instead of 20 and a half, I'm going to go 21, just so that I can make sure that I cut below 162 because that's the very top of the range. A little bit of coolant and engage. Okay, I'm going to pull back, turn it off. It's looking okay, but it's starting to tear a little bit. And that's probably because my tool is starting to wear. Let's take a measurement. Okay, so that's telling me one inch, 150 plus 11 and four tenths. So one inch, 161 and four tenths. Okay, so that's definitely within the size range. Um, whether or not this hits the surface finish call out is something we will need to check now. So surface finishes are something that you're just gonna get a sort of intuition for. You'll look at a surface, maybe 
flick your fingernail across the surface and be able to tell generally about what the surface finish is, okay? But at the very beginning, you're really gonna need some way to calibrate yourself. And that's where this thing comes in. This is a surface roughness comparator gauge. And uh, the way that it works is it has a bunch of these little tiles, right? And each one of these tiles has a different surface finish which was manufactured in a different way. So we start over here with the 500, 500 micro inch surface finish, which is the roughest. And then we go all the way down to a number two or two micro inch finish, which is the finest that's on this gauge. So the various different methods by which they manufacture this stuff is lapped ground, blanchard ground, which is a, a form of like rotary grinding rather than sort of reciprocating grinding like we have on a regular surface grinder. There's turning or shaping, which is basically the reciprocal linear version of turning. And then milled or profiled is, you know, very similar. Profiled is what they're calling like uh, milling with the end of a tool, like face milling or something like that. Whereas M for milled is like using the side of an end mill but basically the same tools, just in different orientations. So here we've got 500 micro inch turned, 500 micro inch profiled with like a face mill or something, 500 micro inch milled with the side of an end mill, okay? And it goes all the way down the gamut. And so we're interested in this area over here, the 32 micro inch, and especially the 32 turned finish, because that's the operation that we're using to manufacture our surface. So the reason I call this a scratch and sniff test is because you're going to use your fingernail, fingernail, to scratch this surface and then scratch your surface and compare the roughness. Yeah, that's pretty close. I mean, how do you know exactly what it is? I mean, all you can tell from this is not even like what range the surface finish is in, but what range it feels like the surface finish is in. So it's not a super precise test here, but let's see if we can get it as good as we can. So if I go to a 16 finish, and I feel that and feel that, well, I think that our surface is definitely rougher than that. Now what if we go one bigger to the 63 micro inch finish? Well, we're definitely better than a 63 way better than a 63. So a 32 is the closest, okay? But when you get a surface finish call out on a print, this number 32 is telling you the maximum surface finish roughness that you're allowed to have. So just by fingernail, maybe it feels like it's closest to a 32, but what if it's like a 38, okay? That's still not good, it doesn't pass inspection. So when we do our final inspection, we're gonna use a profilometer and try to get an actual number for what the surface finish is. But just for an in-process inspection, this is good enough. So how would you improve the surface finish at this point, once the diameter has already been cut, right? I mean, basically at this point, the only way to correct for this is to use some kind of an abrasive. So we've got our old friend sandpaper here, uh, which is what we call a paper-backed uh, abrasive film, okay? If we have a fabric-backed abrasive film, then it's called emery cloth. Emery was like an old form of abrasive that we don't really use anymore, but we still call fabric-backed sandpapers emery cloths, okay? But in any case, so this has, you know, either silicon carbide or aluminum oxide, sometimes diamond, some kind of an abrasive um, of various different grits or sizes, and the finer the grit, uh, meaning the higher the grit size, the smaller the particle size, and that will get you finer finishes. Now, you gotta be really, really careful when you go sanding down a finished surface, because at the same time that you're improving the surface finish, you're simultaneously changing the diameter, right? So if your surface is really poor, in order to get it down to a good surface finish, you're gonna to have to start with a relatively rough grit and work your way down to a finer one, and that is going to dramatically change the diameter, and who's to say that it's going to be a cylindrical surface anymore, right? If you concentrate more in one spot than in another spot, 
right? You're going to get a tapered surface or you're going to get a wavy surface or just because of the way that you're holding the sandpaper on there, you can even make this go out of round so it'll have like lobes on it instead of being a true cylindrical surface, okay? So there are various different things that can go wrong here. The other big thing is a safety thing, all right? These are just loose pieces of paper and if you're putting your hands up onto a spinning part with a loose piece of paper right there, I mean, there's a high likelihood that this is gonna get caught on the part or in the chuck or something like that and it's gonna take your hands with it. So one trick to being able to use sandpaper on a diameter is just to wrap it around a file like this. Okay, now you're, you're a little bit safer, right? It's all compact and tight and your hands aren't in direct contact with a loose piece of paper. So this is a lot better. So despite some of the pitfalls of using sandpaper to improve the surface finish of a diameter, um, a lot of people do this. I mean, every machinist has a drawer just filled with loose little bits of sandpaper and emery cloth like this that they use to touch up diameters. If you're turning a really, really, really precise diameter, like a bearing diameter on a shaft or something like that, uh, you'll often see people finishing the diameter with paper just to dial in that last ten thousandths of an inch or so and improve the surface finish. Another thing that often gets used is this synthetic steel wool, which is often just called Scotch-Brite as like a trade name, okay? So there's actually abrasives embedded in the sort of wool layer here. So this is still using traditional abrasives. They come in different grits also. This sort of like maroon color is a little bit rougher than this green color. You don't have to worry about this changing the size of the diameter nearly as much as you do with the, uh, uh, the sandpaper, but you do have to worry about this stuff getting wrapped up in the part or in the chuck, okay? This third option is the one that we prefer, okay? This stuff is called Kratex, C-R-A-T-E-X. And this is a rubberized abrasive. So it's actually rubber, right? It's, it's flexible and it's been embedded with abrasive. And I think the abrasive is silicon carbide. And it comes in these sort of sticks as well as in these rods. And so this is very nice because it gives a very good surface finish. And because it's not just a loose piece of paper or fabric, um, it's much, much safer to use. Okay? And it even comes in these rods so that you can use it on an inside diameter. Okay? So this is really what we prefer. So let me go ahead and I'll touch up like half of this diameter and you can see the difference. So you just got to put it down on the surface and kind of move it back and forth a little bit. It's not going to take much. I think you can already see the difference. So th this surface is noticeably better than just the finish that came off of the cutting operation. So let's see if that actually made a difference in terms of the size. So this side, the un side, is 1 inch, 161 and 4 tenths. And the Kratex side is 1 inch, 161 and 4 tenths. So no change. That's good. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, touch up both this outside diameter and the inside diameter just to get it nice and shiny before I move on to the next cut. Beautiful. Okay, let's go ahead and finish up this surface right here. 
That surface is going to end up being 1 inch 430 thousandths to 1 inch 433 thousandths, okay? There's no surface finish call out on it. There's no uh, run out call out on it, anything like that, okay? It's just a size, but it's relatively tight, okay? It's 3 thousandths of an inch, so we have to make sure to pay a little bit of a, uh, attention to that. Okay, I'm going to touch off on that surface. All right, set my zero. I'm going to go in 20 thousandths and take a cut. And right there. Back it up one revolution and come off the part. Let's take a measurement. Okay, so we're looking at one inch 450 and a half. So one inch 450 and a half, and we're trying to get down to one inch 433. So that's 17 and a half thousandths. I'm going to go ahead and take 18 thousandths just to make sure that I get under the 1 inch 433 dimension, which is the top of the tolerance zone, the, the maximum limit. Back into my last position, plus 18 thousandths, and engage. Okay, I'm going to back that off, turn off the spindle, final measurement. Okay, so I ended up at uh, 1 inch 425 plus almost seven, so one inch 425 plus six is one inch 431, one inch 431 and seven tenths of a thousandth of an inch. So definitely within the tolerance. Good. Now we have not dealt with this length quite yet, okay? And so that's what we need to do now. So let me go ahead and take a measurement from the end of the part to that shoulder to find out what it is and then we can deal with it based on whether or not it's too short, too long, or if it's just right. Okay, I'm going to use a depth micrometer to measure this. You can see that there are a number of different rods in here, okay? And that's because this one micrometer can measure a bunch of different depths in one inch ranges, of course, because it uses a regular micrometer screw. And all you need to do to move between the different ranges is switch out the, the rod on the back there, okay? So I know that this is gonna be about one inch, 130 thousandths, so I need to be within the one to two inch range. Right now, this thing has the zero to one inch uh, range on it. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that rod and put in the next biggest one. So now when you back this out so that the zeros line up, right there, that should be one inch from the end of the rod to the base here. But, you know, that's something that we really need to verify because when you have so many interchangeable pieces, it's inevitable that you're not going to uh, get a perfect repeatable zero switching between all of the different rods, right? So each one of these rods really needs to be calibrated on its own, or at least, I mean, not calibrated, but zero set. The easiest way to do this I've found is to just use one, two, three blocks, okay? So we're gonna use the one inch dimension on here. Go ahead and put the base down on top of one of the one, two, three blocks, okay? And then you can just run that down until it touches the other one, two, three block, right? So you got to be measuring from a flat surface to a flat surface. The two surfaces have to be parallel to each other, and they should be exactly one inch apart. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. 
Okay, so what does that say? Yeah, so we are a little bit off, right? Let me go ahead and adjust that. Okay, so that's been adjusted. You know, it just gets adjusted the typical way that micrometers do with the little spanner wrench and the spanner hole, and you just rotate this entire sleeve down here that has the, uh, the graduations on it. Okay, let's try this again. Make sure that you hold the base really rigidly and you don't over torque the screw because it's actually really, really easy to get it to start, you know, jacking up one side of the micrometer. Yeah, so that's really close. Very good. Okay, so just go ahead and place it on the end of the part like this. Run it down until it touches that shoulder. Make sure that you're measuring far enough away from that corner radius so that you're not measuring on the corner radius, but rather on the flat shoulder. And let's see, that's, that's it right there. Okay, so what does that say? The tricky thing about reading this is that you're moving the contact points away from each other as you're screwing down the micrometer screw rather than towards each other, which is what we're used to with like an outside diameter micrometer. So the way that you read the graduations is backwards, okay? You can see that it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, 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 all the way back up here to zero. It goes backwards, right? Rather than starting here and increasing numbers, right? It starts here and increases the numbers. And you'll also notice that the 25 one thousandths of an inch graduations on the thimble also wrap around the opposite direction, okay? So what, what's tricky about this is that you have to kind of read from the, the lines that you're covering up rather than the lines that are exposed, okay? So I know that I'm past the 100 thousandths mark because that's not visible. And I know that I'm past the 50 thousandths mark because that's also not visible and I'm past the zero. So it's one inch, 156 thousandths is what this reads right now. And it's only supposed to be one inch, 130, right? So we need to shorten up that distance. And the way that we're gonna do that is by facing a little bit off the end, right? So one inch, 156 minus one inch, 130 is 26 thousandths of an inch. If we remove 26 thousandths of an inch from the face, that'll shorten up that distance. But the first thing that we want to do before that is we want to go in here and finish up the shoulder and square it up and remove that corner radius. We're right here on step number 14, by the way, checking the one inch 130 thousandths length. The next step is squaring up the shoulder and removing the corner radius like I already mentioned. And the reason we do this before we do this is because if we're short, right, meaning it's less than one inch 130, then we're going to adjust that length by touching off with the, uh, the tool that we're going to use to remove the corner radius and just moving it over a little bit before we plunge in. And if it's long, which is what we have here, then we're going to face the end off. But whether it's short, long, or within the size tolerance is going to be important. We need to know this now because it's going to affect how we're going to finish the rest of the part, right? The sequence of operations that we're going to use. Okay, I'm going to use the parting tool to square up this shoulder, okay? I already set the parting tool to the correct height, but I have not set its angle, okay? That's something that we need to do right now, and we're going to do it exactly the same way that we did it for the grooving tool when we did the threaded shaft project. So I put down my little white notepad there just so that I can get some good contrast behind the tool run the tool in a little bit, and we're just gonna adjust it until the gap is uniform from left to right. Give yourself a little bit of a pivot point, and that's looking pretty good right there. So let me tighten it down. Okay, good. Okay, let me go ahead and set this up to the right speed, and let's turn it on. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move the tool up next to the shoulder far enough in right now so that when I move the carriage to the left, I'll actually touch that flat shoulder there with the side of the tool. Move in real nice and slow. I don't want to go changing the position of the shoulder now that I've already measured it. Okay, I can hear it touching. Very good. Okay, so now all I'm going to do is feed straight in. 
and it's going to start cutting out that shoulder or the radius rather. Okay, there it is, almost gone, and I'm going to start touching the main diameter. There it is, right there. I'm going to feed in a little bit more just to make sure that I remove all of the radius. Okay, so I'm, I'm chattering now, so I'm going to slow that down. Maybe the next slowest speed. Let's try this. So this is probably coming from like a dull tool or something like that, okay? Um, now if we have a little bit of chatter, I mean that's not really very bad at all, okay? But if we have a little bit of chatter in there, um, it's going to be all right. But it would be nice to get rid of it, so what I'm going to do is just feed this thing really, really slow, uh, just so we can take the chatter out. And there we go. Now I'll just back up. Yep, that definitely did the trick. That's looking pretty good now. Okay, let me go ahead and remove this tool. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put in my turning tool. Okay, turn on the spindle. Okay, I'm going to come over here and touch off on the end of the part. Right there. Pull back a little bit. Turn it off. Okay, now I'm going to take a travel indicator with a magnetic base on it and put it onto the ways and uh, move that in inside of its measuring range there. Zero it out. Now when I took my measurement, I was at 1 inch 156. And I'm going to get down to 1 inch 130, so that's 26 thousandths of an inch. So move in 26 thousandths of an inch on the indicator and then start it back up and just feed across the surface, either by hand or with power feed, it doesn't matter. Okay, there we go. Let's just double check that with the depth micrometer. Okay, so that's telling me uh, one inch 125 plus 10, so one inch 135. So this is 1 inch 130, so two decimal places, 0.13, so that's uh, plus or minus 10 thousandths of an inch for the tolerance, and we're definitely inside of that. The next step, step number 16, is to cut the 60 thousandths by 30 degree chamfer on the end of the part here. So looking at the way that this is called out, okay, you can see that that 30 degree angle is called out 30 degrees from the center axis of the part, okay? Um, and then the 60 thousandths is sort of along the axis of the part, from the far uh, right end of the part to the left, okay? And so we are not going to do this with the chamfer tool. We're actually going to do this with the same uh, turning tool that we've been using thus far, but we're going to set the compound up to 30 degrees and cut it that way. This is just like what we do to cut a dead center in the chuck when we're doing the threaded shaft project. Okay, so let me go ahead and loosen this. Okay, so here we're at parallel with the spindle axis, right? Compound is parallel with the spindle axis. Now we're going to go 30 degrees this way, okay? And that's because, remember, our tools cut in this orientation. They don't cut on the back side, so we need to orient the compound 30 degrees like this. Okay, I'm going to put the tool back in, in this position now. All right. So here's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be moving the compound back and forth like this, and then slowly moving in with the cross slide just until I touch on that edge right there. And that's what I'm going to call my zero. Here we go. Little by little.
All right, right there, I touched off. Now I'm gonna set up an indicator on the carriage. Right there, zero it out, okay? I'm gonna back off my tool and then I'm gonna move in 60 thousandths and take a cut across that edge. So here it is, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. And now I'm gonna feed with my compound. There it is. That's all there is to it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and remove that tool now. Remove the indicator. Now for the rest of this project, I'm actually gonna leave this here in this orientation. I mean, leave the compound at 30 degrees because we're gonna to have to do another chamfer on the other side, the back side of the part, uh, that's gonna be identical to this one, so why not just leave it in this orientation now that it's already there? Okay, the next step is to deburr all of the edges, and then we're gonna part it off. You can use any number of deburring tool that you want. Um, for the inside of the hole here, it's gonna be one of these two, either the swivel deburring tool or the scraper deburring tool. Um, with either of these, just be really, really careful that you don't re-scratch the surface and mess up your surface finish, okay? I actually prefer the little blade deburring tool. And I just put this into neutral, okay? Put the blade in there and then just kind of rotate it by hand. And that just kind of knocks off the, uh, the sharp corner that's on the inside of the hole. For this edge right here, I'm actually going to use the file, okay? I set this to the slowest speed that it can go, turn it on, and then I'm just going to gently stroke that edge with the file, being careful not to mess up my surface finish because we're perilously close to it, right? But luckily it doesn't take very much. Looking good. Okay, it's time to put the part off blade back in there, okay, but we have moved the compound and so now we have to reset the part off blade, right? So I'm gonna actually go ahead and put it back here, loosen the tool post and swivel this around again, just so we can get the tool post back into its typical orientation. And so another way that you can orient the uh, the part off blade is using the, the swivel on the tool post rather than actually moving the tool around. So again, you're just trying to get it close by eyeball and that's looking pretty good. So in terms of where to set this up, the final overall length of our part is gonna be one inch 630 thousandths, but we're not going to finish that now. We're actually gonna flip this around and put it into the soft jaws and then we're gonna finish the backside to length, okay? So we're gonna set this up just so that we cut a little bit over that size. So just by butting a ruler up against the side of the tool, we're going to line this up so it's about an inch and let's say three quarters. Anywhere between an inch and five eighths and an inch and three quarters is gonna be good here. So that looks fine. Okay, do a quick spin test just to make sure I'm not gonna destroy anything. That looks fine. Turn it on. Okay, go straight in. Okay, as I'm about to start this cut, there are a few things to mention. The part off tool is very, very similar to a grooving tool with a couple of differences. One is that you can see that it's mounted to the end of a blade and that blade is held in its own holder. If you loosen these screws, you can actually move the blade in and out in order to um, part off larger or smaller diameters. You want that to be the minimum that you can get away with so that this tool is nice and rigid. Another thing is that that insert right there is designed so that it actually curls the chips inward and then wraps them up into a tight curl. And that's so that the chips get out of the way and don't bind up on the sides of the groove, which would cause the blade uh, or the insert on the blade to break and potentially even the blade to break. I mean, I have broken these blades off before. But sometimes this cutter will get jammed up, all right? And so I don't power feed this, I feed it by hand 
so that I can feel when it's starting to jam up and I'll pull it back a little bit. It's very, very important with this parting tool also that you have it exactly on center or slightly below, but really you wanna be as on center as possible. Because as you're getting closer and closer and closer to the center, uh, remember that you're gonna start machining like a little nub if you're too high or too low. And with something like this that has such a big broad cut on it, that little nub right there could spell disaster for this entire setup. Finally, what are we going to do when this part actually comes off, right? If we just let it fall where it is right now, it's gonna bounce around on the machine ways or on the side of the cross light over here and it's gonna get dinged up. So we need a way to catch this. One easy way to do it is to just get something soft like this that you can stick in the hole, right? And now when you part it off, it'll fall onto this, you know, the end of this wire brush rather than falling onto the compound. Now that works pretty well. Another thing that you can do is catch it in a plastic bin. Okay, that also works, but it's a little bit awkward and you have to position the plastic bin in kind of a, you know, a precarious position, right? So I'm just gonna go ahead and use the wire brush, right? But be careful because once this comes off, it's usually heavier than you think it is. So you really have to make sure that you've got a good grip on it. Here we go. Okay, it's a good cut. And there we go. That's one side of the bushing done, okay? Now we still need to go in and finish this back side to the overall length and put a chamfer on this corner. But other than that, this thing is done, okay? So at this point, before you move on to finishing the back side of this part, you would go ahead and bring the stock material out, re-indicate it, and then machine the second bushing to this point. And then we would change the setup and finish the backside of both bushings together, okay? That's a production technique that splits up the operations or the setups rather than splitting up the parts, right? So instead of finishing one part in its entirety before moving on to the next one, right? You do as much as you can with the setup that you have, realizing that it's the setup time that usually takes you the longest. Once you've got everything set up uh, and all your tool heights and everything, then you can bang out a bunch of these pretty quickly. Then you would go in and change your setup and then do the same operation to the backsides of as many parts as you have. Hopefully that makes sense. But I'm going to save that for another video. So we'll have another part to this demonstration and I will see you then.